the P-51 Mustang, one of the fighters that undoubtedly won the skies over Europe in World War II. The only thing more important than this legendary aircraft, the brave men who flew them. In this video, a P-47 and P-51 pilot who flew over 100 missions over Europe walks us through his journey to become a fighter pilot and his first dogfight with a skilled German pilot that nearly cost him his life. And then he pulled out and I was going like a bat out of hell. I'm going straight down over Kiel, Germany. I can see it today. Let's relive his story, relive his missions, and hopefully save history. It is 1942, and after the United States' recent entry into World War II, many young men have jumped into action and volunteered to serve their country. One of these brave young men would be a New Jersey boy by the name of Edward McNeff. Ed joined the U.S. Army Air Corps, and like most, the dream was clear. He wanted to become a fighter pilot. But this was only for the cream of the crop, and not everyone would make it. So Nashville was an intake center to uh, find out what we might be uh, qualified for. And everybody, or nearly everybody, wanted to be a fighter pilot. And we went through a battery of tests to see what kind of reflexes we had. And uh, we had to put stylus in little holes and don't hit the edges and put round pegs in, in round holes as quickly as we could. And, and then uh, after all that and, and learning how to be a military person, we did a lot of physical training. And, and eventually they put the sign, put the list up on the bulletin board that said what your, what is, uh, what your next station is going to be and what your uh, plane is going to be. And of course, we all readily run over to the bulletin board and, and look and see where we were going. And I was glad to see that I was going to be a fighter pilot. As 1943 went by, Ed was sent to flight training. Before he could be sent into combat, he had to learn to fly the premier fighters that the U.S. had to offer. After advancing from the trainers, the first of these military planes was the P-40 Warhawk. He would eventually master it, but not before one close call. And then I was sent to Spencefield, Georgia for advanced training where we flew the AT-6, and the AT-6 had a retractable landing gear, and uh, we were moving on up. And while we were there, we got uh, 10 hours in the P-40. And uh, that was an interesting experience in itself. It's the first and only fighter airplane I ever put in a spin. And I didn't do it intentionally, it just fell off when we the first thing you do when you go to a new airplane is practice stalls and find out the stalling speed and, and maneuvering and how you control the airplane when you lose flying speed. But that was successful and the, the whole, whole thing turned out all right because I graduated from flying school in August of 1943. After moving on from the P-40, he was tasked with flying the P-47, the most advanced fighter aircraft that the U.S. had to offer. When we first took off, when you first walk up to a P-47, you say, oh my God, because, you know, you're coming out of, you, you've got 10 hours in a P-40, which was like a, a, a small airplane compared to a P-47. But the P-47 had that very, very large radial engine in it. So the airplane itself was big. And uh, we always used to say that uh, an elephant is a mouse built by Republic Aviation because they make big airplanes, fighter planes. In January of 1944, after passing evaluations in the Thunderbolt, Ed got news that it was time. He was finally being sent over to England to join the 355th Fighter Group in the war against Germany. 
This was a crucial time in the battle against Hitler, as the Allies were doing everything possible to try and destroy German defenses and production from the air. Thus, Ed's arrival could not have come at a more crucial time. Here, in early 1944, he would be flying the Thunderbolt, the primary fighter aircraft of the 8th Air Force. The P-47 by now had proven to be a brilliant fighter. It was an extremely effective ground attack aircraft and a formidable dogfighter as well. But above all else, it quickly became known for its ability to take a beating in combat but still get its pilots home. In these Thunderbolts, the primary role of the 355th Fighter Group would be Bomber Escort. This was a vital job in the war over Europe, as the US Army Air Force had come to the quick realization that the B-24s and B-17s, while outstanding planes, simply could not get the job done on their own. They would unquestionably need the aid and protection of fighters. Originally, when the B-17 was designed, it was presented with a very unique concept that it was a bomber that did not need any fighter escort. It was a plane that would be able to be its own escort, completely able to defend itself, because with eight guns all around the aircraft, it was essentially an impenetrable fortress, a flying fortress, if you will. But as fighter technology developed over the coming years at an incredible rate, it quickly became known that this was not the case, that bombers, no matter how heavily fortified, simply could not operate without the aid of fighters to help protect them. Fortunately, American fighter pilots like the boys of the 355th would help solve this problem. This is where Ed would fly, but before he could see his first combat, he had to become accustomed to his new home and airfield. We can see here from Ed's combat log that he took his first flight in early February of 1944, but these first few weeks of flight would be just local missions, practicing formation flying over England. Coincidentally, during this time, the combat pilots of the 355th that had arrived well before Ed were in the midst of their biggest action so far, the famous Big Week. This clash took place from February 20th to the 25th of 1944 and involved thousands of Allied aircraft taking on the might of the Luftwaffe. During these many dogfights in February, many of the men in the 355th scored their first aerial victories and there was plenty of fighting to go around. But for the entire month, McNeff, along with the other new arrivals, were still working on formation flying as they took local flights. On March 2nd, however, he would get his first taste of action. On this day, he was assigned to an escort mission to the Frankfurt area. And fortunately for him, this would be a fairly normal mission, with no enemy aircraft sighted and no trouble in their flight. The next few missions would be mostly uneventful as well, with the 355th encountering little more than scarce flak on these missions. As Ed tallied his first few combat missions in the P-47, he quickly began to fit right in with his unit and became a part of the Brotherhood that was the 355th. But right as he was getting settled in, a significant change would take place. Although their beloved P-47s provided much needed support for the bombers, their ability to protect the fortresses and liberators had one clear limitation, range. Originally, the P-47 was the fighter escort for the U.S. Army Air Force, and it served this role very well. It was able to keep up with the bombers, it was able to stay with them for a decent amount of time, but the biggest problem was that as the bombers moved their targets deeper and deeper into Germany, the fighters could not stay with them as long as they needed. And one of the very strategic and wise moves that the German Luftwaffe did in World War II was that they realized exactly where the fighters had to pull off of the bomber formations. And once they figured this out, they would wait until exactly that moment that the P-47s or other escort aircraft had to peel away from the bombers, head back to England, and that is when the German fighters would attack, the moment that the bombers were left unescorted. 
Because of this, after less than five combat missions in the Thunderbolt, in early March of 1944, a new aircraft arrived at their airbase in England, the P-51B Mustang. This brand new fighter was to be assigned to all of the 355th, and it would solve the problem of range and more. When I first got to the 355th, we still had P-47s, so my first uh, sorties were flown in the P-47. And the problem with the P-47 was that it didn't have any legs, it couldn't go any place. And it could go maybe to middle of France, and then it had to go home. And then all of a sudden, somebody found the P-51. And they realized they had the perfect airplane. The Mustang was almost instantly loved by nearly all of the pilots that entered the cockpit. It was faster, more maneuverable, and had a much longer range. Being water-cooled, it lacked the ruggedness of the P-47, but in a dogfight, this was a trade-off that many pilots were willing to make. Ed remembers vividly about making this transition and how they had to learn this new aircraft. That was an interesting experience in itself. The P-47 was a truck, kind of. It was powerful enough once you got up to speed, but it took a little while to get it up to speed. And uh, it kind of used up a lot of runway to get off the ground. And then we got the P-51 and uh, we all had to go through the, go out in the cockpit and sit in the cockpit and learn the switches and the knobs and everything, and then uh, somebody would come out and give you a blindfold cockpit check. And you put a blindfold on and uh, they'd ask you, where's the landing gear, where's the flap lever, where's the radio? And each time they'd ask, you had to use your fingers and touch the item. And if you could do that well, then you were able to solo the P-51. It only had one cockpit. So uh, your day came when you go out and start it up and taxi out to the end of the runway and uh, push the power forward and go. And uh, the biggest thing in airplanes like that, when you put the full power on and the prop is rotating, if it's like that, there's a counter force that turns the airplane that way it's called torque so you had to be careful of, of how you put the flat power on and how you manipulated your feet because your feet were on the rudders and and you were keeping the airplane straight down the runway with your rudders but uh, compared to the uh, p-47 the P-51 jumped off the runway and you were airborne practically before you knew it. And that was the uh, introduction to the best airplane that was built in that time. Upon being assigned to his new Mustang, Ed was now a regular of the unit and had earned his own nose art, opting to paint his P-51 after his wife back home, Kay. Unbeknown to him, it would be in this fighter that Ed would go face to face with the Luftwaffe for the first time, nearly ending his career as a fighter pilot. This fateful mission would take place on March 16th, where he and the rest of the 355th were serving as fighter escort for a large raid to Augsburg, Germany. As the mission progressed, they flew near the bombers and all was going well. As they were approaching their target, however, for the first time in his tour, a message went out over the radio that broke the silence. Bandits, one o'clock. It was Messerschmitts up ahead, headed right for them. And as Ed was about to find out, these were experienced and highly skilled German pilots. The German pilot that I met the first time I met uh, an ME-109, uh, we were in squadron formation, that's four ships, four ships, four ships, four ships. And we were at about 
28,000 feet trying to get to 32,000 where there were eight or nine ME 109s. And, you know, at, 30, at 28 and 29,000 feet, you're not climbing all that fast in a P-51, but that didn't matter. But this one guy, he's up here a couple of thousand feet, and he peels off, and I'm going, I'm going after him, and I'm going down, he's going down, and I'm going down, and I'm not gaining on him, and all of a sudden he snap rolls it. Now, what exactly is a snap roll? This is a high-level maneuver that is usually only executed by seasoned pilots. Instead of just a simple roll, the snap roll actually involves a quick stall of the aircraft by rapidly pointing the nose of the plane upwards before executing a roll. This causes the plane to rapidly lose speed in seconds, which in this dogfight was exactly what the German needed. Well, he snap rolled that ME 109. Of course, that bled his speed off. And he snap rolled it the other way. And then he pulled out, and I was going like a bat out of hell. I went straight down and entered what we call compressibility. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going straight down over Kiel, Germany. I can see it today. And I can't move my fight, my control stick, and I can't move my rudders because they're locked with pressure, air pressure going straight down. As Ed McNeff watched the German fighter fly past him, he immediately realized that he was in trouble. Fortunately, the Messerschmitt left the engagement, seeing that the Mustang was plummeting straight down. But now, Ed was the one in a predicament. Currently, in a nearly vertical dive at the earth, his plane had locked up on him. Falling at well over 500 miles an hour, the controls of the Mustang were essentially frozen and he was unable to exit the dive. Well, we had been taught and, and instructed what to do when you enter this possibility and I, I did it. I didn't, you don't use your trim tab to try to get it out. You just keep a little pressure on the stick and hope that sooner or later you will, and I did, as I got down to around 8,000 feet, from 28,000 feet, I started coming out. And there I was, practically, I was alone. I didn't know where any, anybody else was. But you gotta give that German pilot credit for knowing how to fly that airplane like that. Just before meeting the ground in Kiel, Germany, Ed was able to pull the nose back up, avoiding a blackout or worse, structural failure that would take him right into a collision with the ground. As we look at the first air-to-air -air combat that Ed McNeff experienced in World War II, we can see that at this early point in 1944, the German pilots were still very experienced and very formidable adversaries. This particular 109 that Ed McNeff was pursuing pulled a maneuver that changed the table and really flipped the script in this particular dogfight. Ed McNeff very quickly goes from a position of advantageous on the six o'clock of his enemy to now the enemy is behind him. And if Ed McNeff had not been in such a fast and uncontrolled dive, it is very possible that the German pilot would have remained on his six o'clock and potentially even shot him down. After this close call in his first dogfight, Ed was able to return to base, but it taught him one thing that these German pilots were indeed skilled and that he had to be on his toes to prevent another situation like this from occurring. It was a learning experience and would provide valuable insight for later on. However, his tour of duty was just beginning. In the coming weeks, Ed McNeff would have his greatest trial yet, facing a deadly situation with his wingmen, the loss of a beloved leader, and more. All of this will be in part two of Ed's story, coming soon in another video. This story was only able to be told because one of you guys, a viewer, sent us an email and told us about Ed. So if you know a veteran of the air war, please send us an email here today. Don't wait.
so that we can hopefully tell their story. And these trips are getting more and more expensive, but we're going to continue to do it to save history. So if you could help support us by checking us out at the Patreon link below and making more stories like this one possible, it would go a long ways and you can get great bonus content. So please consider supporting and I'll see you next time.